So the thing that happened that I didn't expect is the lack of preparation uh, by the American team. I'm very surprised that President Biden and his team went there and came back with so little uh, from the Saudis and that this was a total win for the Saudis. Hello and welcome to G Zero World. I'm Ian Bremmer and today, President Joe Biden just finished a whirlwind tour of the Middle East. He had stops in Israel, the occupied West Bank, and Saudi Arabia. It was his first visit to the region since taking office. With gas prices and inflation hitting record highs recently, Biden was there in part to ask Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman to increase Saudi oil production, helping bring down prices at the pump. It's a matter of great concern for American voters. But a fist bump with MBS comes with strings, even if the trip did further American interests. And this week, I speak with Princeton professor Bernard Haeckel about whether Biden's visit was the right move. He's a renowned expert on Saudi affairs, and he has the crown prince on speed dial. Then in 2018, women in Saudi Arabia were granted the right to drive. But for one activist who helped pave the way for progress, it came with a jail sentence. But first, Istanbul, October 2nd, 2018. Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi walked into the Saudi consulate to obtain documents for his upcoming wedding to his Turkish fiance, Hatice Senjiz. After waiting patiently for more than three hours, Senjiz finally asked consulate staff where her partner was. Staff there said he had left through the back door, but leaked audio recordings eventually released by the Turkish government told a horrifying story. The transcript records many voices and noises, then says, scream from Jamal. Again, scream, then gasping. Noises are identified as sore and cutting. According to the CIA, the order to kidnap and kill Jamal Khashoggi came directly from Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who serves as de facto ruler of the country. U.S.-Saudi relations have been strained since Biden took office. Biden had refused any direct engagement with the crown prince, promising when he ran for president to treat the kingdom as a pariah on the international stage. But the president's recent trip to the region has made MBS look a lot less like a pariah and more like a partner. Biden claimed this trip would advance important American interests, and he's right even if neither see eye to eye on human rights. These sheiks of Arabi attract lots of attention wherever they go. The kingdom has been a valuable partner of the United States since the 40s. As a top oil exporter, it can help lower American energy prices. It's America's largest arms purchaser in the world and is very aligned with the United States on regional security in opposition to Iran, providing vital intelligence and counterterrorism cooperation. And for what it's worth, MBS has been making changes inside the kingdom, including meaningful and overdue social and economic reforms, enhancing the role of women, diversifying the economy away from oil and petrochemicals, downgrading the role of religious law, and generally making the country more open, tolerant, and investable. The Saudis have also been working closely behind the scenes with Israel, America's closest ally in the region, and they've blessed the ongoing normalization of relations between the Jewish state and the Arab world. In fact, during the visit, Saudis even announced they would open airspace to all international carriers that includes Israeli ones. But after failing to secure clear deals on oil and security, Biden's trip to the kingdom looks more like a win for the crown prince than it does for the president. This week, I speak with Princeton professor Bernard Haeckel. He's a renowned expert on Saudi Arabia. He's also a confidant of the Crown Prince. Here's our conversation. Bernard Haeckel, thanks so much for joining us. It's a pleasure. Of course, a fair amount of controversy uh, in the meeting between Biden and MBS. You know the Saudi Crown Prince personally very well. What happened that you did not actually expect? So the thing that happened that I didn't expect is the lack of preparation uh, by the American team. I'm very surprised that Biden, President Biden and his team went there and came back with so little uh, from the Saudis, that they hadn't agreed to something in advance, and that this was a total win for the Saudis in terms of PR, in terms of uh, reass reaffirming the centrality of Saudi Arabia in the Middle East. Uh, it's, a, it's a complete victory for, 
for the Saudi, for MBS and for the Saudi government, Saudi state. Now, I mean, I understand that it's a big deal to get the American president to come and visit, but I, did, I, did I miss, were there announcements from the Americans that um, actually moved the ball from the Saudi perspective? Basically, uh, the, the stuff on Iran that, you know, there's a commitment to never allowing Iran to have a nuclear weapon, that they that America will help defend Saudi Arabia from attack on its territory, pres- presumably from Iranian proxies, especially the Houthis in Yemen. Um, you know, all of that is music to Saudi Arabia's ears. And the Saudis were able to show that they have tremendous convening power. I mean, they were able to bring all the GCC leaders, the leaders of the countries of the Gulf, and the Iraqi prime minister, the president, uh, the king of Jordan, and the president of Egypt. And it just signaled that Saudi Arabia is simply the most important country in that region, and that you need it both for the stability of the region as well as for global energy stability. If we were talking a, a few years ago, of course, the Qataris certainly wouldn't have been in that group. That's one of the bigger things that has changed, uh, is the fact that the GCC feels more unified, more aligned. Do you think that is stable? It's very hard to say that it's stable because, you know, these are highly personalistic regimes where individuals can wake up one morning and decide one thing that runs counter to the past. But what I get from the Saudi leadership uh, and and also from the UAE is that uh, there's been a steep learning curve and that, you know, playing the kinds of games that they played with boycotts of each other and so on are very counterproductive. Um, And so, uh, for instance, now they've wired the electrical grid of Iraq to the GCC, or they're about to do that. That's a very good thing. It brings Iraq out of, you know, partially out of Iran's orbit and into the GCC orbit. So I, I think there is some maturity there. And, and that's something that the Americans have encouraged, and I think rightfully so. We can get into the big geopolitics, but I want to ask you a little bit about Mohammed bin Salman himself, because, you know, he has been one of the most controversial, provocative figures on the geopolitical stage globally. Um, And some of that has been revolutionary in a positive sense. Some of that has been revolutionary in a very negative sense. How do you make sense of that from a global perspective? So look, I mean, he represents uh, a phenomenon that we see in other countries as well. You know, a, a very strong nationalist populism, a strong authoritarian streak. I mean, we see this in India, we see this in Turkey and other places, as you well know. But in, in his case, I think w- what's happened is that he really had to consolidate his power and centralize his power. In order to do that, he's had to emasculate large numbers of the royal family, including the key individual that was America's favorite, uh, that is his cousin, Mohammed bin Nayef, who is, you know, the darling of the CIA and British intelligence and every other Western intelligence agency. And then was under house arrest for, you know, years, right? He's had his wings clipped. Okay, let's put that, you know, putting it politely. And, and many others have as well. He's also had to completely and radically change the business as usual in the country. Uh, which involved a tremendous amount of corruption and stealing from the treasury, uh, from elites, including members of the royal family. He's had to also emasculate the very reactionary forces in the country, the Islamists, the hardcore Islamists, who are the only ones who can mobilize large numbers of people in, in the streets against him. So he, that consolidation effort was extremely brutal and messy at times, uh, and it involved, of course, the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. Um, I think now... All of that is pretty much in the past. He's very much in power and will, will become the king unless he's assassinated. So he can rest a bit easier. Biden claimed that he brought up the Khashoggi issue with MBS. MBS, in return, said that uh, he talked about uh, Abu Ghraib uh, and other American human rights abuses, the Israeli slaying of a Palestinian journalist recently um, that they denied uh, officially. Um, is this relationship ever going to have meaningful discussion on human rights? So the problem with the issue of human rights is whenever you raise it with the Saudis, they see it as an, an, inter, you know, an intervention in their sovereign, domestic sovereign kind of affairs. And they'll always turn around and say, you know, but, you know, uh, who are you to tell us? You know, you invaded Iraq. You did this. You did that. You, you know, you droned people in Afghanistan. So I think, you know, it's best if you have those conversations. I think those conversations ought to be had, that they be had 
you know, sotto voce, not in public, uh, that they, sh- they, they, you will get much more uh, out of the Saudis if you uh, speak to them privately and insist that these are issues that matter. And that, in fact, they're not only just good for America, they're also good for Saudi Arabia. So can we at least say that MBS is less likely to directly order the assassination of journalists going forward? Oh, absolutely. I I mean, I I don't think that they will ever uh, do anything like that again. And look, frankly, you know, I'm going to say this, you know, and I think in some ways the Khashoggi murder, uh, tragic as it was, in a way saved a lot of other journalists from being killed. I mean, the, 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 the blowback from that from that event was so, uh, de- you know, serious uh, and, and, and I think demoralizing for the Saudi leadership that they will never do that thing. They'll never do that again. I mean, that doesn't mean that they won't, you know, try to extradite people and put people in prison and all that. They will. But this kind of rogue operation, I think, is in the past. Now, let's go back to the Biden uh, trip itself. Uh, you know, you, you say that uh, the Americans didn't get anything from the Saudis. The one concrete decision that was made, it's small, but it's symbolically important. And there have been a number of them from around the region. Um, of course, Biden's plane came directly from Israel. And the Saudis have said that they're opening airspace to everyone that's licensed, meaning that the Israelis can now fly uh, through Saudi airspace. That actually seems like a real policy shift. Well, I would describe it as crumbs, uh, giving crumbs to Biden, because that was already baked into the Abraham Accords, into the agreements that they had made with the, uh, with the Trump administration. If you remember, Israeli airplanes could fly and, and were flying over Saudi Arabia to go to the UAE and to Bahrain and to India. Those are the three countries that they'd given permission to. They just now opened it up in return for, you know, an Israeli agreement, which again was also baked in earlier for uh, the Tehran Island, which is that island that uh, is between Saudi Arabia and Sinai, Egypt. All of that had been agreed to before. So, you know, it was, I, I see it as cosmetic. I don't see it as substantive. And it, of course, it does not include uh, the Israelis and the Saudis uh, having an agreement to open diplomatic relations formally. The Saudis have been saying privately they weren't ready to do that. Why aren't they ready to do that? There's so much engagement happening between the two countries. I think there is a sense that the Saudi public, and you have to remember, this is a, although it's an absolute monarchy, it has a finger on the pulse of its own public. It, 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 it is a kind of like a tribal um, uh, political structure, uh, and they feel that their public is not ready for that yet. Um, and I think they will not do it until something is given to the Palestinians, something that is, you know, respectable. But, you know, look, the Saudi, the Saudi-Israeli relationship is going to get warmer and warmer as the Iranians, you know, increasingly uh, decide that, you know, both these countries and the regimes of both these countries need to be toppled. Iran has been the single most important factor in bringing these countries together. And that's not changing. What do you think the implications are for the Saudis uh, if and when the Americans and Iranians make it clear that they cannot come back to the nuclear deal? I don't think the Saudis or the Israelis, for that matter, are very keen on the JCPOA, on the, on the nuclear agreement with the Iranians, because they feel that there aren't substantial teeth there. There isn't enough there. And in fact, with the withdrawal of the sanctions, the Iranians will get lots of money and then they'll do more They'll, they'll, you know, spread more mayhem through proxies in the region. I guess you could argue that um, even though there weren't many concrete accomplishments from the meeting, that the Saudis are moving in a direction broadly that is more aligned with U.S. national interests, both in the region and more broadly in terms of the countries that they engage with. And so, I mean, to the extent that's the case, um, you would expect that there would be a warming of relations between the two countries. Yeah. I mean, I think the Saudis are a status quo power. They're not a revolutionary power like Iran is. They're very keen on stability in the region. And this, this has very concrete implications. So right now, for instance, as you know, the price of wheat and barley and so on has gone through the roof because of the war in right. Ukraine. So what the Saudis are willing and able to do alongside the other GCC countries is to give money, lots of money, to the Egyptians and to the Jordanians and to the Sudanese and other countries that need 
uh, money to buy foodstuffs to feed their own people, including Yemen, by the way. And so the single largest uh, threat to stability in the region are bread riots in, uh, across the region. And this is where the Saudis can play a hugely important role in subsidizing the food because, uh, because bread is subsidized in, in these countries. Um, so I think the Saudis are on the same page with the Americans here. And this meeting basically puts a lot of the kind of virtue signaling that was going on before uh, over values and human rights. It basically puts an end to it and says, look, we have core strategic interests in this region. This country is really important for the United States. We have to go back to business as usual. Bernard Haeckel, thanks so much for joining us. It's a real pleasure. Thank you. MBS has made several reforms in Saudi Arabia that have improved the lives of women. But the fight for freedom has come at a cost for some female activists. GZRO World's Alex Clement has the story. This video, shot in 2014, shows an act of civil disobedience. Lujain al Hadlul is behind the wheel, attempting to cross into Saudi Arabia, which at the time was the last country on earth to prohibit women from driving. In 2018, that changed. Women can now drive. Okay. It's our right, finally. We took it. Some have even started racing in rallies out in the country's sprawling deserts. All thanks, in part, to Lujain. But at the time, Lujain herself could not celebrate. Weeks before the driving ban was lifted, she was arrested in the United Arab Emirates, flown to the Saudi capital of Riyadh, and jailed for her activism. She spent more than a thousand days in prison, where she says she faced violence, torture, and threats against her life. Her family, including her youngest sister, Lena, fought tirelessly for Lujain's release. My sister was imprisoned, and at the very beginning, of course, we did really not know what to do, how to act. MBS was doing all these tours in the world. He was applauded. After a couple of months, when we found out that my sister was actually being tortured and that she almost died uh, during torture, that's when we realized that silence is not an option. Uh, we have to be Lujain's voice. Lujain was released from prison on probation in 2021 but rights groups say she is far from free. Lena, who has not seen her sister since 2017, just released a children's book based on Lujain's story. We had this idea of uh, you know, bringing Lujain's um, fight of driving in an analogy, in a magical way. Lujain, a little girl who lives in a, in a world where only boys are allowed to wear their wings and fly to a col colorful world. Um, and this is exactly Lujain's story. And so I really want kids to really know that, you know, when they feel that there is injustice, they can say it out loud and they can win it, basically. U.S. President Joe Biden's recent trip to the kingdom has angered human rights advocates, including those at Dawn, a nonprofit founded by Jamal Khashoggi shortly before his gruesome murder in 2018. The group's executive director, Sarah Leah Whitson, says MBS's tight grip on power has led to unprecedented levels of political repression. The important message that Lujain's arrest sent was that you subjects in this country are not allowed to tell me what you want or what you want me to do. I decide. I am an absolute monarch. You are not allowed to have an opinion about what I should and shouldn't do. For G Zero World, I'm Alex Clement. That's our show this week. Come back next week. And if you like what you see, and I know you do, or just if you want to hang out with the Saudis, and everybody does, why don't you take a minute to sign up for G-Zero's most excellent morning newsletter. It's called Signal. <laughs>